Hello and welcome to Tricycle's 30th anniversary celebration. I'm James Shaheen, Tricycle's Editor-in-Chief. This is the first live session in a series that we'll host over the next several weeks. And we'll be talking with many of the people, old friends and new, who have, made, who have been central to Tricycle's success. Today's session will be recorded for anyone who is unable to attend live. You can view any of the session recordings as well as the speaker lineup and schedule for upcoming events at the same link that you're at now. We are providing these events for free, so if you haven't already and you want to support Tricycle, please consider donating at the button below. We will have some time for a Q&A towards the end of our, this hour-long discussion. You can ask a question by typing it into the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of the screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can, and then Sharon Salzberg will close the hour with a short meditation. Our guests today are Sharon Salzberg, Jack Cornfield, and Joseph Goldstein. Their bios are far too long to be told in full here, but importantly, they are the founders of the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts. And Jack is also the co-founder of the Spirit Rock Meditation Center in Woodacre, California. Amazingly, these three have practiced, published, and taught for over the for over the <laughs> Over the last half century, I, I say half century, I was gonna say 50 years, but half century sounds so much better. And this year, IMS is celebrating its 45th anniversary and Spirit Rock its 35th. Is that correct, Jack? I think it's 35 years, 1986. It's something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I count? think it's 35 years. And of course, we're celebrating our 30th. So happy anniversary to all of us. So I'm going to ask do we, you. Do we have a? Do we get like an anniversary cruise or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> I think that would be a good idea, sort of like an IMS Spirit Rock cruise. Post post COVID anniversary cruise. Thank that, you. I'm a, I'm up for it. I'm sort of at the age where I'd take cruises. I don't. I have no problem with that. Okay, so first I'm going to ask uh, you questions all together, and any of if any of you can answer, and feel free to talk to each other, and then I'll ask individual. Uh, questions. So, so many anniversaries. Um, any reflections on that? Sharon, you want to start? Uh, time is the most mysterious thing imaginable. Like I can't, uh, I can't even fathom how that can be. Uh, Joseph and I met in India at my very first retreat. That was 50 years ago. I met Jack not long after that. Uh, I think uh, three years after that when I came back to the States and we were all in Boulder, Colorado. Um, it feels like it could have been yesterday and also it could have been a thousand years ago. So it, it's uh, altogether very strange. What are your thoughts, Jack? Well, there's, there's these two strange things. One is that this whole thing unfolded not to our doing. We happened to be um, in a place where the Dharma stream was flowing and it carried us and it opened all kinds of gates and doors in this country in the west and we were able to somehow offer a little bit and be part of this unfolding that wasn't our doing um and then um it's also paralleled with the very strange even though it's obvious and taught so often by the buddha the very strange thing about growing old um because there we were um Quote Sharon's mo one of Sharon's most memorable lines, doing it all without adult supervision, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in an era where we were taught not to trust anyone over 30, how about people over 75? <laughs> <laughs> so, Joseph? Well, I, I concur with and have the same feeling that both Jack and Sharon expressed. But sometimes when I look back also over all these years, uh, it's quite amazing just to see uh, the organizational developments, you know, that happened. Uh, because, of course, when we started, you know, we were very enthusiastic about the Dharma, but we really had not the vaguest idea of how to run an organization. <laughs> so over the years, it definitely had its ups and downs as we figured that out. Uh, and it's beautiful just to see kind of the organizations coming into their own maturity. You know, as we as we learned from a lot of the mistakes and uh, seeing what worked and what didn't work, uh, so to see that maturation, you know, has really, been really gratifying. 
Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, so much has changed in the 25 years that I've been going. Yeah. So what would you say has changed most? I'll start in the same order, Sharon. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, as I often recount, when I came back from India in 1974, and uh, for that whole period, you know, if I was in a party or some social situation, remember this? And I was introduced as a meditation teacher, or people would say, what do you do? Which is what we say. They'd say, I'm a meditation teacher. They would kind of go, oh, that's like weird or <laughs> esoteric or... Every once in a while, somebody would say to me, did you meet the Beatles when you were over there? And I'd say, well, no. Sadly, they went when I was in high school, plus a different, different lineage. And now, or just before the pandemic, if I were in a situation like that and introduced, most likely the response would be, I'm so stressed out, I could use some of that. And so I think just the, um, the greater understanding of the... Uh, kind of not, you know, the lack of a need to join a belief system or become something and really make an experiment with your own awareness. It, it's so much more widespread. And um, I think the science and the research has, has made a big difference in that way. So, Jack, what's changed most? Well, first, I, I, I want to piggyback on something that Sharon and Joseph pointed to previously that the way things unfolded, um, it wasn't just that we were there when this Dharma stream was carrying us and others, but also that this is a good medicine and that the culture really has needed it. Whether you talk about stress, as Sharon said at a party, you know, on the kind of very simplistic way, can you help with that? But people have this, have had this sense and certainly in my generation from the 1960s, that things were not right in the way, in the values of the culture when it became as speedy and materialistic and uh, the levels of injustice and various other things like that. And the medicine of the Dharma of compassion, of interdependence, of understanding of the possibility of freedom, these are things that that we've needed so much because most of the problems in the world um, come from human beings, you know, continuing war and racism and tribalism and climate change. And those need to be changed in the human heart. And so do, you know, for our well being individually and collectively. So this medicine somehow, this understanding um, was really needed in the culture or called into the culture. And we became. Part of that, at first, it was esoteric, as Sharon says, people didn't know, like, that's really weird. Um, and now there's a common understanding that we need this. And as she said, also, all the neuroscience of these last years has made it very accessible to people to feel they don't have to join a, um, a religion or a cult, but that it's actually about changing their own heart. Thank you, Jack. Joseph? Uh, well, when I think back, especially over these maybe last 10 years, um, one of the biggest changes, and it's been a change both organizationally and for many of us, many of us personally and profoundly, is just the uh, engagement uh, with really trying to understand diversity and equity and inclusion uh, as an organization as part of the teachings. And I know for myself, uh, just myself personally, there was just so much to learn, you know, and when we started just the work in training and trying to explore and understand the problem, uh, I was amazed and a little shocked at how clueless I was, you know, over all these years growing up in this culture. But the work we've done now for about 10 years and culminating both at Spirit Rock and IMS just this year is the completion of two of the teacher training programs, uh, really focusing on uh, training new teachers of color. You know, and so that whole issue uh, has just, it's brought a tremendous uh, uh, energy you know, and in a really powerful way to this whole uh, area. 
And it's been, it's been hugely uh, eye-opening, heart-opening, and rewarding, you know, to, to see this. And, you know, we're, we're still in the process of continuing it. But that, that really, for me, has been a huge change from when we began. Yeah, I understand Spirit Rock just graduated a group of teacher trainees and that, that IMS will in May, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that is a huge change. Um, yeah. So a lot of people are asking me this question. They're asking how the retreat centers are weathering the pandemic. Um, uh, I sit more probably, but you know, uh, that's one thing. How about the retreat centers where we typically gather uh, to sit? Sharon, you wanna start? Yeah, uh, well, everything is closed right now. I, I mean, I get um, notices, you know, by email about the slow reopenings of various centers around. I think IMS, um, we closed, I think, uh, March 10th or, or thereabouts, maybe March 15th last year. And we look forward to reopening as well. I think one of the um, really interesting things was going up online very quickly offering different programs. I think the first was Joseph and I teaching together and uh, it's still continuing. It's like, as I read this chat right now, I see people signing in from all over the world, which is like so gratifying. And I think such a testament to Tricycle's influence. And it's been the same in, in teaching online. You know, I, I'm an inveterate chat reader and thank you for the compliment of my cup, by the way. Uh, whoever wrote that, we can I can describe my cup a little later. Um, and you know, to see people as as we're teaching signing in really from all over the world, or or people saying, I could couldn't have come on retreat now in this phase of my life anyway. I have an elderly mother I'm taking care of, and and this is like a, a godsend to have be able to do this in my home. And of course, it's complicated and hard for people and the people doing childcare and the people who are not home, people who are out working and it's a complex thing, but I think it, it's really, um, it's been a gift to be able to do this. Thank you, Sharon. How about you, Jack? So Spirit Rock, like IMS is closed and <clears throat> they're, they'll reopen, they're doing fine. There's enough tremendous amount of goodwill and a big community that loves them and there's some money in the bank. Um, I worry about some of the smaller retreat centers, but a number of them, they will be okay. The big shift, as Sharon points to, is pivoting to online and we are learning things um, that we would not have imagined. And one of them being that many people describe um, taking an online retreat at home as still being deep and effective, which was a surprise to us. Um, and, you know, when you ask about the way things have changed, um, mindfulness, compassion, these trainings, they've become culturally normal now, um, as much as we'll ever be normal, I don't think. But, um, but uh, so part of the balance now is how do we support the mainstreaming with diversity, with all kinds of issues so that it actually helps people and how do we not lose depth? How do we keep the deepest trainings, the longest retreats, the best training for teachers? Um, that really matters to us. And, and somehow we, we, we are a little bit the stewards still of, the, of that, those paired um, and complementary qualities. And it's not new. It's tr true in all the Buddhist countries that we trained as well. There'll be a very popular level of teaching and then those who really want to pursue it in a deep way. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jack. Um, Joseph, anything to add? Uh, I think Sharon and Jack expressed uh, most of it. Uh, I guess I just want to do a little shout out to the Sangha, you know, the, uh, whether it's IMSs or Spirit Rock or Tricycle. Uh, one of the reasons I think that uh, we have survived okay during this time and during this closed period is because there's been tremendous support from the Sangha, you know, and it's been remarkable, you know, of how um, people connected to the various centers or the magazine 
uh, have really stepped up, you know, in this time to sustain, you know, these organizations during this time. Uh, it was really inspiring and, and wonderful to see that happening. And the other thing that <laughs> was quite surprising to me, because as we do these online retreats, um, you know, each, each setup is differently, but the way we do it here, basically, I'm speaking to the back of an eye patch. <laughs> so I can't see anybody, you know, but what has been so amazing to me, and this has been true every online retreat I've taught, is that very soon into the teaching, the iPad disappears and it really is, it feels like I'm talking into the Dharma space and in my mind's eye, not my physical eye, it really feels this intimate connection with people I can't see, you know, and I kind of love that. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful feeling just to be speaking into, in a way, the void and yet feeling so connected at the same time, you know, so that's, that's been quite striking to me. That's great. It's been great to discover how resilient we can be. Uh, and how everything has continued. And, you know, somebody wrote, I think Sharon pointed out to me uh, earlier, somebody wrote, I don't know these three teachers, which I, I was surprised, but of course there are those who don't. Um, so I just wanted to say, if you're interested in knowing more about Spirit Rock and IMS, you can go to dharma.org for uh, IMS and spiritrock.org uh, for uh, Spirit Rock, um, and there are plenty of offerings there, and you can offer your support there as well. Um, I'm going to go to individual questions now, and I'll start once again with Sharon. And you wrote the book, Loving Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness. It's been more than 25 years now, which is amazing to me. And I'm wondering how teaching meta has changed for you since you published that book. And um, I hear it everywhere now. So, and you had a lot to do with that. So, what's on your mind about that? Uh, well, I went to Burma in 1985 and did this intensive period of loving kindness, which is metta, M E T T A, in Pali, in Pali language, um, uh, retreat. And, and I was so moved by it and I felt so changed by it. Um, that when I came back, I'd already been teaching, you know, since 1974, but I really began emphasizing the teaching of loving kindness. And it was um, certainly less popular. And I think a lot of people were expressing the kind of culturally normative suspicion of it, like that's just about feeling good or that is uh, about being self-satisfied or um, what's this thing about offering loving kindness to yourself? That's, you know, you lose all standards of excellence. That's just something sentimental and gooey. And, uh, you know, and I certainly heard that a lot. And of course I still hear it, but um, it's very different now in that I think people who were already practicing meditation with an emphasis on mindfulness and in many cases have seen that mindfulness has a kind of implicit loving kindness in it or it's not mindfulness, it's it's being more greatly aware of something and then judging yourself for it, uh, which is different than mindfulness. And so uh, it's always been there, but maybe not so explicit or so highlighted. And, and also, you know, to carry on with something that Jack was talking about, this is um, a time, you know, where we see so much disconnection, we see the consequences of disconnection, and we see the consequences of othering, uh, we see so much that is pretty readily apparent in the lack of love or the lack of kindness between people. And it's also a time where if anything is more glaringly apparent, it's interconnection that uh, we may feel isolated, we may feel all alone, but the actual truth is that our lives are intertwined and that what happens over there doesn't nicely stay over there ever it ripples out over here and what we do, what we care about, where we devote our energy, it too matters because it will ripple out. And so uh, the essence of loving kindness is an understanding of interconnection. Um, it's not about trying to force you to feel something gooey at all, 
but deeply, deeply knowing that our lives are connected and the heart's response to that. And so um, I, I think it's probably more relevant than ever. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Jack, I know that you recently organized a march to raise awareness of what is happening in Burma, which is truly tragic. I mean, there's been a coup in that country. Um, there's been violence. Um, and I'm wondering how you see social action in terms of your Buddhist practice and teaching. Are they one and the same? Do you see yourself on one hand a citizen, on the other hand a Buddhist? How do they come together for you? Uh, I can't divide them any more than I can make the d division of psychology on one hand and Buddhist meditation on the other or, you know, the environment and they're all of a piece. It's exactly what Sharon was speaking about of interdependence. And it's not a new thing. Um, there are instances going all the way back to the original Bud Pali text where the Buddha stood in the way of opposing armies to try to get them to stop going into conflict. There, you know, there was a very well-known and important uh, focus on bringing absolute respect and equality among people irrespective of birth or caste or race and so forth, which was completely different than the way Indian society was organized. Um, so it's been there in the DNA of the Dharma from the beginning because it's an expression of interdependence and compassion. And it gets emphasized by different teachers in different ways. Um, for me, I can't, I can't divide them any more than when Joseph talks about all of us learning more about diversity and inclusion and equity. It's, it, is, it is the Dharma, because the Dharma is the, the teaching of love, as Sharon talked about, from interconnection and respect. And that is a place of liberation. Um, so it's a place. So the march, of, the march on the Golden Gate Bridge, I was talking to friends in Burma, and the situation is terrible. Um, and it continues to be so, although there's a little sense that, that the world is not just standing by and letting it happen. There are, there are at least some movements of sanctions that it's not okay for a huge army to start killing its own people just for economic power, pretty much. Um, and so I started to get all these images. And, and then I asked, well, what can we do to people who are in hiding in Burma? And they said, let us know that you're with us. So, all right, let's do a big march on the Golden Gate Bridge and send the images back to Burma so that they know that, and I know it's true for Sharon and Joseph and all of us who love and respect what we've learned and what the treasures that's been so generously given from countries like Burma and Thailand, that we're with you. And I'm thinking about, do we do more marches? What I'm involved in other projects to try to help um, because it's, it's, uh, it's tremendous suffering and it feels important to respond. Yeah, and the upcoming uh, issue of Tricycle of Burmese Artists presents a portfolio and just getting that uh, interview was nearly impossible. It was from someone in Burma. I mean, the situation is dire, uh, I understand. Yeah. And thank you for your work, that's fantastic. Um, Joseph, I just wanted to ask you again about your book, Mindfulness. It was, it was, uh, um, published a while ago, but it's a pretty comprehensive guide. It's, it's, you, you'll object completely, but I kind of look to it like the Vasudhi Maga or something like that. Um, so I still refer to it often, and I wonder what inspired it? What did you feel was so at stake uh, that, that you actually put together this pretty significant work? Uh, could you say something about that? Yeah, well, of course, we, we all teaching in, in Vipassana, you know, insight meditation, it's all based on this one discourse of the Buddha, the Satipatthana discourse, uh, which is the four foundations of mindfulness. So we had been teaching based on that sutta for years. And then um, some years before I started working on the book, I read a, a book by Analio Bhikkhu, who is this German monk, brilliant, brilliant scholar, monk, and practitioner on the Satipatthana Sutta. And he, um, in some way, he, he brought it even more to life for me uh, because he went through it uh, 
you know, in some detail. And so his book inspired me to go back uh, and really look at that sutta line by line, you know, and seeing what it says. And out of that, uh, I started giving this long series of talks at the Forest Refuge, you know, our long-term meditation center. So over a four-year period, I gave about, I don't know, I think it was about 47, 48 lectures going through this Satipatthana Sutta. And I was learning so much by doing that. So just as an example of, you know, how sometimes diving deep into something that uh, you may be using, but never really exploring fully. So this is just one tiny little example. Um, you know, I was talking about the uh, dependent origination and the links and came to the link of contact. And I thought, how am I gonna give a talk on contact? You know, it seemed, it seemed dry, boring, and not much to say about it. As I went into it, you know, and did a little study and exploring and reflecting, I ended up giving three hour long lectures on contact. <laughs> yeah, so just that, that's the kind of energy and uh, enthusiasm, you know, that developed from digging deeper into this core, uh, this core text. And I just want to make one other point, which is connecting this question to your last one, to, to Jack. And it's something that I've just been reflecting on and giving a couple of talks more recently. Uh, there is a very clear link between the meditative insight and this uh, engagement with the world and the Brahma Viharas, you know, of metta and compassion. And the link going from insight and understanding to engagement with the world has to do with a phrase that is in the texts a lot, you know, in, in many, many discourses where the Buddha says, see things with perfect wisdom, not mine, not I, not myself. See everything with perfect wisdom, not mine, not I, not myself. Well, very interesting thing, when we take the I, this self-centeredness out of the picture, the natural manifestation of that is compassion and engagement. It's like it's the I that is getting in the way, the mind that's getting in the way, you know, because we try to protect it and defend it and do all kinds of things. And so our inside practice, as we loosen the grip of I, me, mind, then there's just a, a natural flowing and engagement in the ways that Sharon and Jack just talked about. Thank you. I was going to ask you more specifically about liberation, but, but I think you sort of covered it there. Or... <laughs> Yeah, no, I need mine. That's it. Yeah, exactly. I, I saw. I know you just came out of a three-month retreat, and I attended attended the retreat, and I really loved that talk. And I was just listening to a talk of Jack's as well. Um, but you know, last time I interviewed you was seventeen years ago, and I didn't wear glasses, as I was saying when we were all together in the green room. <laughs> so a lot has changed. Turns out I age too. Um, but I'm wondering. Um, just a little bit of a walk down memory lane. I'm wondering, I always love hearing the story of how you guys started. At, at, was it at Naropa? I mean, you were all living in Joseph's apartment, Sharon. What was that uh, story about everybody crowded? Joseph's the only one with a job or something. <laughs> well, Jack had his own apartment. Um, oh, good for you, Jack. Uh, jo Joseph can talk about how he ended up at Naropa. It was at Naropa that uh, we kind of planted some seeds and, and it was at Europe that I met Jack and, um, you know, it was the inaugural summer summer of Europa Institute and uh, Jack was teaching a, a class. Uh, Joseph was Ramdas's TA, his teaching assistant, teaching the meditation section of his mega class. And uh, I got back from India and some friends and I had the thought, oh, you know, Joseph's the only one with a job and an apartment that we know of. Let's all go to Boulder. And at one point, literally, I think nine of us moved into Joseph's one bedroom apartment. And 
he can tell that story from his own experience as well. Uh, but, um, and anybody who knows Joseph knows he's an extremely meticulous person. I think it was not the easiest thing in the world, but uh, it was there that it, it kind of all got, I don't know, there, there was the synergy, it was all of us being together, it was, and some other friends as well. Um, and something happened so that, you know, based on that time, we started getting invitations to lead retreats and everything was in the retreat format in those days, not in Europa, but, you know, our own teaching. And so we'd get a letter from somebody saying, I can get together some friends and a cook. Will you come lead a retreat? And some combination of this small group would, would come together and respond and, and go teach it. And at the end of the retreat, we never knew if there was going to be another retreat until the next letter came. And so uh, it, it was that kind of process that was, which actually leads me, this is, this is another question, but uh, it leads me to remembering the first time I ever saw Tricycle Magazine, which was some years after that. Um, and I remember being so kind of surprised and uh, thrilled. I thought somebody made a magazine out of things I'm interested in. Like, Wow, like what an incredible thing. Thank you. That's good to hear. All of you were in Tricycle before I came to Tricycle 25 years ago, all three of you. Um, so before I get to Jack, Joseph, what was that like having nine people move into your apartment? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad there, is, there is a follow-up to, to that story uh, related to the last comment I made. So when all these friends came and, you know, nine people in my apartment, it was a little stressful because I was also working really hard. You know, I was leading, I don't know, six or seven meditation sessions a day, you know, as part of Ram Dass's big class. So I was working hard, I was taking a lot of energy and here were these friends, but <laughs> crowded in my apartment. So it was a bit stressful at first, but then I kind of saw the, the suffering that, you know, the, the stress uh, that I was feeling. And I just investigated a little bit and I realized the whole problem was that I thought it was my apartment. <laughs> and when I let go of the sense, oh, this is mine, then it became just a shared space with friends that we had done countless times in India. You know, we had been living in just that way and enjoying it and having a good time. So it was a very striking example of how mine and my, you know, I mean mine, gets in the way of ease, you know, and, and loving feeling. Um, so that was the end of the story. So when I let go of that, then it would, then we were just having fun. And it was, there was a, a kind of an immediate connection, I think, among us all, you know, and a kind of synergy. People, people who do know us are familiar we're really all quite different. You know, our styles are different and uh, just the way we talk about things is different, but they complement one another, I feel, really well. You know, so I feel like we made a really good team, uh, you know, as we were launching this whole endeavor. Thank you. And I, I wanna- <clears throat> I, I wanna add, yeah, go ahead, Jack. I was going to you next. I wanna so. add, um, first, that I learned a tremendous amount from both Joseph and Sharon. You know, Sharon might have written the Meta book, but as everybody who's been to IMS may have heard, she's also the one that put Meta over the door by rearranging the letters years before that. So it, it wasn't just at that time, but, and it's not that I've only learned Meta from Sharon. I've learned a lot of things from her, from her depth and her integrity, um, the kind of the, you know, one of the beautiful virtues in, in the Buddhist teachings is that of an ethical or virtuous heart of seeing um, with kind of purity. And I've learned so much and from Joseph as well. Um, and there's a, there's a certain way. I, I also learned about community because I practiced in these monasteries and they were communal. But when I came back, it was kind of alone. And they had this whole posse of people who've been in India together and who loved each other and who loved the Dharma. And I got to be part of that. And then in my way, as we started IMS, I could bring in other people like Christina Feldman and Christopher Titmus or, you know, people from the Ajahn Chah lineage. And we could put together Thailand and Burma and the things that we 
that we knew were parallel, uh, I couldn't have done it in the same way at all without having met Joseph and Sharon and learning from them. And there was a kind of partnership where um, I was thrilled to hear them give Dharma teachings. Uh, Joseph, who studied philosophy at, at Columbia, you know, and gave these exquisitely crafted talks with beautiful poems and, and you know, references and quotes. I said, wow. And Ram Dass did that too. And so, I thought, wow, look at that. Look how skillful they are as teachers. And, you know, of course, I stole what I could. I copied it. <laughs> <laughs> and much gratitude. It's there's just there's some way we learn and support each other um, in this way. The, the three of us and others who are now our colleagues that has made an enormous difference in the way things have unfolded. And uh, and it is what Joseph points out about how important community is. You know, it's so great to be with the three of you. That was so nice, Jack. Um, like I said, it's been 17 years since we were gathered together. So it's just really wonderful to see you again. I'd like to go to the questions from our listeners. Um, uh, and uh, the first one uh, I'm going to go to uh, is somebody who asks, and any of you can answer this, any advice for how to deal with information overwhelm and the desire to learn, even in the domain of meditation and mindfulness? Is this a good, I'm trying to clarify the question a little bit. So in other words, there's, there's such an abundance of Dharma teachings now online and how to manage that. Is that was that the I think I think that is um, information overwhelm and the desire to learn. Even in the domain, even in the domain of meditation and mindfulness. So, you know, yes, um, both. Just information overwhelm, and there's so much dharma out there now online. I, I imagine, especially. <laughs> what just came to my mind? Uh, this is really just off the top of my head. So, uh, maybe a value, or maybe not. Uh, maybe to create a uh, a ratio you know, in one's life. So for every, so I'm kind of making this up at the moment, you can adjust it. Um, maybe for every hour, every two hours of learning, have five hours of practice. <laughs> you know? And then another hour or two of learning and then five hours of practice. <laughs> because the important thing in receiving all the information you know, especially Dharma teachings, is to put them into practice. Uh, and so one doesn't want to get so addicted just to the, to the cognitive aspect, which is important. I mean, that's the foundation for doing the practice, but then actually engaging in the practice. And I think that's what will be really transformative. Okay, this is a hard one. I don't know who, unless Sharon or Jack, you have anything to add, I move on to the next. This is a hard one, I think. Deirdre asks, what is the most important piece of wisdom you have heard and or learned over time? Maybe it's easy, I don't know. Liz, it's, you know, um, the most important thing I would say is that suffering isn't the end of the story. That in my response is basically that captures the Four Noble Truths at the very heart of Dharma teachings that there is suffering and that in the society and the world we live in and human incarnation, it's there, that it has causes, greed, hatred, ignorance. We can see it, fear collectively and individually. It's not the end of the story that there is a path to inner liberation and that our liberation is tied up in the liberation of all those around us. Um, and, and the fact, as Joseph emphasized so much, practice, the, the, I think the reason that these mindfulness, compassion, all the things that we talk about have spread <clears throat> is because they offer practices that actually transform the heart and the mind. Um, so that's it. Suffering isn't the end of the story. Great. Joy, freedom, beauty, liberation. Thank you, Jack. Um, so Scott asks, what advice would you give to someone in their early 30s about spiritual life and practice? Sharon, do you want to try that one? Yeah, way back when. <laughs> um, 
I, I mean, I, I think there are different elements. You know, there's the, the element that's completely timeless. Um, and uh, it's not going to be pegged to, you know, the phase of life one is in. But um, and then there's just the the reality of, um, you know, having a career or, or a family or uh, having a broader sense of spirituality than just being on retreat. And, you know, that's also that's also really pertinent. But I mean, something I really um, did a lot myself is, you know, many people have heard me talk about in the beginning of the pandemic, especially was um, I had written a book, ironically enough, completely before the pandemic turned it in. Uh, and then the publication of it was delayed. And so that gave me a little period in which I had the chance to write a forward, you know, or a preface for it. So um, I kept asking myself the question, like, what's still true? Like, what's essentially true? Despite disruption and chaos and upheaval and anxiety and grief and everything I and, and the people I knew were going through and what's still true. And that made me reflect on the Sanskrit word Dharma, which is often translated as the Buddha's teaching or the truth of things or uh, the nature of things. And my understanding is that another translation of it is that which supports us, that which sustains us, that which upholds us. It's what we can count on, what we can rely on. And, and I think uh, at any age, that's like an essential question to be asking oneself because um, that helps or reorient our priorities and uh, our sense of what we really care about and, and going for what we really care about. So I think that's a pretty useful exercise. Oh, thank you, Sharon. It's a wonderful answer. Um, Adam asks, um, I'd love to hear how they feel their styles of teachings differ. Joseph, I know you mentioned that you all complement each other in your teaching. Uh, but some Adam is asking, how do you see your styles of teaching differ? I don't know if that's an easy one to answer, but. Jack, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say one thing, you know, it was like, I, I remember um, reading manuscripts uh, of each of their books before, you know, they were finally edited or whatever. And uh, I saw that Joseph spoke in complete paragraphs. It was like extremely logical and systematic. And Jack and I are, I think, much more similar to one another than, than to Joseph in presentation. In that if I, I read um, what Jack had written in, in this manuscript, and often it was taken from transcripts, you know, in those days. And and it was uh, more about you know, like kind of an energetic exchange. It was about connection. It was about uh, storytelling. And that might involve as an effective public speaker, that might involve a lot of repetition, which doesn't look right on the page. You think, well, you just said that, you know? Um, and so uh, you can see a lot of differences in, in approach. Mm -hmm. I agree with Joseph that you really do complement each other. Um, so Joseph, is, Joseph, to me, this is it's a delicate question. Joseph, to me, represents the beauty of emptiness. And in, in all, <laughs> see, Joseph, you are beautiful, and that's <laughs> that's your, that's, uh, and Sharon represents the beauty of love. Um, and I'm trying to figure it all out. <laughs> Something like that. I'm telling stories about it. <laughs> Maybe I, 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 Jack, I, th I think you represent the uh, the energy of creativity. You know. Wow. So I remember going back, go, going back to the early years. I, I don't know if you remember when they they were trying to test meditators with the Rorschach test, you know, the ink blots, which I think is now not, not in favor anymore, psychologically. But so in those days, they would 
they tested uh, the three of us uh, and others, you know, these Russia tests. And most of us, you know, we would see an ink blot and we would have, you know, maybe five, you know, five uh, interpretations of, of what it looked like. They had a stop jack, you know, after a hundred or so. <laughs> okay, Jack, let's move on to the next one. <laughs> because it's just that creative part of your mind, which, you know, is, is really quite wonderful. I want to add something that's it's a non sequitur, but it's something I want to get in before you do the next question. And that is really um, an homage and an honoring. First of all, we had amazing teachers. My teacher, Ajahn Chah, you know, your teachers, Manindra and Goenka and Deepama, and then later generations that, that have come. Um, so we had, we, we had teachers who were um, the most celebrated masters of their time in those cultures in many ways, at least by the time. So we were enormously fortunate to have that. And then we had somewhere in the range of teacher colleague, people like Ramdas, who was really important in our lives. And yesterday was Ramdas's birthday, if I'm remembering correctly. Thank you. Um, because his, his vision of carrying Dharma, and he became more and more a master of love more than anything. Um, but also such skillful teaching means and such support for practice that that too affected all of us. It was a big part of what brought us together in some way and how we collectively grew. And I just want to honor the, the, the lineages that, that we share. It's very, very true. And Jack, this is gonna this is gonna sound really strange, but do you remember speaking of your creativity, was it a Nasruddin story about somebody ending up in jail? Uh, anyway, there was one time here when you told it, uh, but you changed the ending. Yeah. Which was a riot because everyone there had heard it like fifty thousand times already, <laughs> and you just thought, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch characters and, and change the ending." And... No shame. <laughs> and was like, All right, you know, it was very funny actually. Creative. Well, well and Trudy, and Trudy, once in a while gives me a hard. She said, "Are you gonna tell that same story over again?" <laughs> and and I'll say it's like my grandson Desmond, who's two and a half years old. He wants to hear the same story at bedtime again. He did. What do you want to hear? Read that one again. So I'll say that to a group. Now here's your bedtime story. <laughs> but the, the Buddha also told there were certain stories that are so central to who to our awakening, if you will, to that possibility um, that they actually become really important to tell in our own way. Um, and uh, I think Muriel Ruckheiser, the great poet, she said that the universe is made of stories, not atoms, um, which fits a lot with the Buddhist nature of mind, um, that there's some way in which we commune with one another energetically, as Joseph found, even through the screen, but also the Buddha told the story of his enlightenment. I sat under the tree and this is what I saw. And people say, oh, I want to enter this story. This is a story that touches me and that we can, we can live inside, something like that. That's really nice. It's great to hear you talking to each other. I was wondering how that would happen. Um, just related something to something, uh, Jack, you just said about the extraordinary experience that all of you had with such amazing teachers. And that is something very special and that, that many of us are aware of. So Tyler asks, I find myself feeling gently envious of the cross-cultural living experience you all had in developing yourselves and bringing the Dharma back to the West. What do you think is the 21st century version of that for those of us who dream of a similar immersive cross-cultural experience that goes beyond daily practices and occasional day-long retreats? Well, there's a three-month retreat, but go ahead. What a beautiful question to start with. Um, I'm, I don't, I, you know, I don't have a quick answer to it, but I just want to note that the places that we practiced are still there. Yeah. And that, that the one thing that's true is that for someone who wants to have that adventure, um, you can go to India or to Burma or to Thailand 
and find places to practice and live in a Buddhist culture. And they've changed a lot in 50 years. It's not the same as it was, but it's, it's a remarkable thing to be in a culture where the Dharma is kind of the ground of how everything is organized and people know it and support it. Uh, and so there is that, that's the, that's one possibility, but there's something deep in the question that maybe the others can, can speak to how else in this time? Yeah, you know, I wouldn't go to Burma right now, but, uh, yeah, or for the foreseeable <laughs> future, but, um, uh, I think there are a couple of things. One is that those teachers are, you know, that we were completely blessed to have contact with are actually at least somewhat available through books, uh, through recordings. Um, there's a, an entity known as um, Dharma Seed, which has recordings of many of the talks given at IMS or around the country. And I was looking uh, at their catalog because I was trying to find actually a particular talk and and by joseph actually and then and then i saw wow my teacher deepama is there you know she's the woman who told me to teach and um she's there because she visited ims and uh there's so much that's available there's so much that's available actually through tricycle um you know of of some of the great teachers that we got the chance to study with and then also um there are elements of the cultures, as Jack is saying, that you can experience to some extent here. Like um, one of the kind of nice Burmese cultural uh, aspects is that on your birthday, the idea is that you celebrate not by getting gifts, but by giving gifts. And so people would often go to the monastery and they'd offer food to as many meditators as they could afford to um, feed. and you know, the year I turned 50, which was some time ago, I went to Brooklyn to a Burmese monastery so I could offer food to the monks. And I met these incredible monks who had been very strong in the democracy movement um, in Burma, who had been in prison, who, who'd finally left and, and had a monastery in Brooklyn. So um, there are elements of, of that kind of culture of generosity, of care, of, of respect that you can find here that are, are wonderful to connect to. Joseph, do you have anything? Did you no, have I think Jack and Sharon captured it. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up pretty soon. So I guess this question can have a rather short answer, but you know, we're in lockdown. Of course, people cannot travel right now, but they can go online to dharma.org or spiritrock.org or tricycle.org and, and there are a lot of different teachers from different traditions who pass through Tricycle and and certainly uh, uh, diverse uh, teachers who go through both Spirit Rock and IMS. Um, do you, since we're in lockdown, do you have any advice on how to find a Buddhist teacher? I feel that studying and practicing on my own is too lonely and doesn't take me out of my mind. That's from Saffron and we have maybe 90 seconds. I, but I think that I would just look at um, or explore the Dharma talks of different teachers, which are readily available, whether it's in Dharma Seed or in other places online. And then when you find the teacher that you really resonate with, you know, from their talks, then you could pursue trying to make a connection, see where they're teaching, perhaps, you know, join in retreats they're offering, whether online or in person. Uh, but there's a big opportunity to uh, kind of survey the field beforehand to see where, you know, where your heart is pulled in terms of being with a particular teacher. Mm -hmm. And I want to speak to the prior question because underneath that, you know, could we still go and have the experiences you and Sharon and Joseph have, that there's a longing for a deep initiation into Dharma and to the path of liberation. And I just want to say it is here for you. If you look and you're genuine about it, liberation is possible and that maybe you'll do a three month retreat at IMS or two months at Spirit Rock as a warm up for a lifetime of practice. And, but these possibilities are here and they, they, they really change you um, with, your, with your good interest and intention. Um, it's still all here. 
Well, thank you all. So before uh, Sharon takes us out with a brief meditation, I'd like to thank you again uh, for joining us today. And thank you everyone for being a part of the discussion. And happy anniversary to IMS, uh, to Spirit Rock, and to Tricycle. Um, so Sharon, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, great. I'll start with my mug, which is banging your head against the wall is never fun. Uh, people have been uh, really kindly in, the, in these uh, pandemic times sending me mugs with things I often say on them. And apparently, this is something I often say. Uh, so I have a really interesting collection. Um, another mug I have uh, says, truly, don't worry about it, because that's the meditation instruction I often impart. So just in these last few minutes, maybe we could sit together quietly. If you like, you can close your eyes. Bring your attention, say to the feeling of your breath, something that's already happening that you can access easily and rest. Just rest your attention on that object. Let's say the breath, wherever you feel the breath most distinctly, the nostrils, the chest, or the abdomen. Just rest. You don't have to do anything or change anything. And when you find your attention wandering, you get lost in thought, spun out in a fantasy, or you fall asleep, truly, don't worry about it. The healing of the practice is being able to let go gently and with kindness toward yourself, begin again, start over. We let go and we begin again. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank all three of you. Uh, thank you so much. It's lovely to see you. So uh, to our listeners, stay tuned to our next event next Tuesday, April 13th, and check back at the event page to view the schedule and the speaker lineup. Again, you can visit uh, tricycle.org, uh, dharma.org for IMS, and spiritrock.org for Spirit Rock. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. May everyone be healthy and safe. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary.